Hello there, dear listeners. And welcome to the fourth episode of Journey Around the World in 80 Days. In the last episode Mr. Philias Fogg and Passepartout had successfully traversed the Suez Canal in Egypt and are currently on board the steamboat Mongolia as it makes its way down the Red Sea. Trailing our duo is Mr. Fix, a detective, who is convinced that Philias Fogg is, in truth, a bank robber on the run and his journey around the world as a mere sham to allow him to flee with his ill-gotten gains. So, let's commence with our story. Chapter 9 in which the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean prove propitious to the designs of Philias Fogg. The distance between Suez and Aden is precisely 1310 miles, and the regulations of the company allow the steamers 138 hours in which to traverse it. The Mongolia, thanks to the vigorous exertions of the engineer, seemed likely, so rapid was her speed, to reach her destination considerably within that time. The greater part of the passengers from Brindisi were bound for India some for Bombay, Others for Calcutta by way of Bombay, the nearest route thither, now that a railway crosses the Indian Peninsula. Among the passengers was a number of officials and military officers of various grades, the latter being either attached to the regular British forces or commanding the Sepoy troops, and receiving high salaries ever since the central government has assumed the powers of the East India Company, for the sub-lieutenants get £280, brigadiers, £2,400, and generals of divisions, £4,000. What with the military men, a number of rich young Englishmen on their travels, and the hospitable efforts of the purser, the time passed quickly on the Mongolia. The best of fare was spread upon the cabin tables at breakfast, lunch, dinner, and the eight o'clock supper, and the ladies scrupulously changed their toilets twice a day, and the hours were whirled away, when the sea was tranquil, with music, dancing, and games. But the Red Sea is full of caprice, and often boisterous, like most long and narrow gulfs. When the wind came from the African or Asian coast the Mongolia, with her long hull, rolled fearfully. Then the ladies speedily disappeared below. The pianos were silent, singing and dancing suddenly ceased. Yet the good ship ploughed straight on, unretarded by wind or wave, towards the straits of Bab el Mandeb. What was Philia's fog doing all this time? It might be thought that, in his anxiety, he would be constantly watching the changes of the wind, the disorderly raging of the billows, every chance, in short, which might force the Mongolia to slacken her speed, and thus interrupt his journey. But, if he thought of these possibilities, he did not betray the fact by any outward sign. Always the same impassable member of the Reform Club, whom no incident could surprise, as unvarying as the ship's chronometers, and seldom having the curiosity even to go upon the deck, he passed through the memorable scenes of the Red Sea with cold indifference, did not care to recognize the historic towns and villages which, along its borders, raised their picturesque outlines against the sky, and betrayed no fear of the dangers of the Arabic Gulf, which the old historians always spoke of with horror, and upon which the ancient navigators never ventured without propitiating the gods by ample sacrifices. How did this eccentric personage pass his time on the Mongolia? He made his four hearty meals every day, regardless of the most persistent rolling and pitching on the part of the steamer, and he played whist indefatigably, for he had found partners as enthusiastic in the game as himself. A tax collector, on the way to his post at Goa, the Reverend Decimus Smith, returning to his parish at Bombay, and a brigadier general of the English army, who was about to rejoin his brigade at Benares, made up the party, and, with Mr. Fogg, played whist by the hour together in absorbing silence. As for Passepartout, he too had escaped seasickness, and took his meals conscientiously in the forward cabin. He rather enjoyed the voyage, for he was well fed and well lodged, took a great interest in the scenes through which they were passing and consoled himself with the delusion that his master's whim would end at Bombay. He was pleased, on the day after leaving Suez, to find on deck the obliging person with whom he had walked and chatted on the quays. If I am not mistaken, said he, approaching this person, with his most amiable smile. You are the gentleman who so kindly volunteered to guide me at Suez. Ah, I quite recognize you. You are the servant of the strange Englishman. Just so, Monsieur. Fix. Monsieur Fix. Resumed Passepartout. I'm charmed to find you on board. Where are you bound? Like you, to Bombay. That's capital. Have you made this trip before? Several times. I am one of the agents of the Peninsular Company. Then you know India? 
Why yes, replied Fix, who spoke cautiously. A curious place, this India? Oh, very curious. Mosques, minarets, temples, fakirs, pagodas, tigers, snakes, elephants. I hope you will have ample time to see the sights. I hope so, Monsieur Fix. You see, a man of sound sense ought not to spend his life jumping from a steamer upon a railway train, and from a railway train upon a steamer again, pretending to make the tour of the world in 80 days. No, all these gymnastics, you may be sure, will cease at Bombay. And Mr. Fogg is getting on well? Asked Fix, in the most natural tone in the world. Quite well, and I too. I eat like a famished ogre, it's the sea air. But I never see your master on deck. Never, he hasn't the least curiosity. Do you know, Mr. Passepartout, that this pretended tour in 80 days may conceal some secret errand, perhaps a diplomatic mission? Faith, Monsieur Fix, I assure you I know nothing about it, nor would I give half a crown to find out. After this meeting, Passepartout and Fix got into the habit of chatting together, the latter making it a point to gain the worthy man's confidence. He frequently offered him a glass of whiskey or pale ale in the steamer barroom, which Passepartout never failed to accept with graceful alacrity, mentally pronouncing Fix the best of good fellows. Meanwhile the Mongolia was pushing forward rapidly. On the 13th, Mocha, surrounded by its ruined walls whereon date trees were growing, was sighted, and on the mountains beyond were espied vast coffee fields. Passepartout was ravished to behold this celebrated place, and thought that, with its circular walls and dismantled fort, it looked like an immense coffee cup and saucer. The following night they passed through the Strait of Bab el Mandeb, which means in Arabic the Bridge of Tears, and the next day they put in at Steamer Point, northwest of Aden Harbor, to take in coal. This matter of fueling steamers is a serious one at such distances from the coal mines, it costs the Peninsular Company some £800,000 a year. In these distant seas, coal is worth three or four pounds sterling a ton. The Mongolia had still 1,650 miles to traverse before reaching Bombay, and was obliged to remain four hours at Steamer Point to coal up. But this delay, as it was foreseen, did not affect Philia's Fogg's program. Besides, the Mongolia, instead of reaching Aden on the morning of the 15th, when she was due, arrived there on the evening of the 14th, a gain of 15 hours. Mr. Fogg and his servant went ashore at Aden to have the passport again visit. Fix, unobserved, followed them. The visa procured, Mr. Fogg returned on board to resume his former habits, while Passepartout, according to custom, sauntered about among the mixed population of Somalis, Banyans, Parses, Jews, Arabs, and Europeans who comprise the 25,000 inhabitants of Aden. He gazed with wonder upon the fortifications which make this place the Gibraltar of the Indian Ocean, and the vast cisterns where the English engineers were still at work, 2,000 years after the engineers of Solomon. Very curious, very curious, said Passepartout to himself, on returning to the steamer. I see that it is by no means useless to travel, if a man wants to see something new. At 6 p.m. the Mongolia slowly moved out of the roadstead, and was soon once more on the Indian Ocean. She had 168 hours in which to reach Bombay, and the sea was favorable, the wind being in the northwest, and all sails aiding the engine. The steamer rolled but little, the ladies, in fresh toilets, reappeared on deck, and the singing and dancing were resumed. The trip was being accomplished most successfully, and Passepartout was enchanted with the congenial companion which chance had secured him in the person of the delightful fix. On Sunday October 20th, towards noon, they came in sight of the Indian coast, two hours later the pilot came on board. A range of hills lay against the sky in the horizon, and soon the rows of palms which adorn Bombay came distinctly into view. The steamer entered the road formed by the islands in the bay, and at half past four she hauled up at the quays of Bombay. Philia's fog was in the act of finishing the 33rd rubber of the voyage, and his partner and himself having, by a bold stroke, captured all 13 of the tricks, concluded this fine campaign with a brilliant victory. The Mongolia was due at Bombay on the 22nd, she arrived on the 20th. This was a gain to Philia's fog of two days since his departure from London, and he calmly entered the fact in the itinerary, in the column of gains. Chapter 10 In which Passepartout is only too glad to get off with the loss of his shoes. Everybody knows that the great reverse triangle of land, 
with its base in the north and its apex in the south, which is called India, embraces 1400,000 square miles, upon which is spread unequally a population of 180 millions of souls. The British crown exercises a real and despotic dominion over the larger portion of this vast country, and has a governor-general stationed at Calcutta, governors at Madras, Bombay, and in Bengal, and a lieutenant governor at Agra. But British India, properly so called, only embraces 700,000 square miles, and a population of from 100 to 110 millions of inhabitants. A considerable portion of India is still free from British authority, and there are certain ferocious Rajas in the interior who are absolutely independent. The celebrated East India Company was all-powerful from 1756, when the English first gained a foothold on the spot where now stands the city of Madras, down to the time of the Great Sepoy insurrection. It gradually annexed province after province, purchasing them of the native chiefs, whom it seldom paid, and appointed the governor-general and his subordinates, civil and military. But the East India Company has now passed away, leaving the British possessions in India directly under the control of the crown. The aspect of the country, as well as the manners and distinctions of race, is daily changing. Formerly one was obliged to travel in India by the old cumbrous methods of going on foot or on horseback, in palanquins or unwieldy coaches, now fast steamboats ply on the Indus and the Ganges, and a great railway, with branch lines joining the main line at many points on its route, traverses the peninsula from Bombay to Calcutta in three days. This railway does not run in a direct line across India. The distance between Bombay and Calcutta, as the bird flies, is only from 1,000 to 1,100 miles, but the deflections of the road increase this distance by more than a third. The general route of the Great Indian Peninsula Railway is as follows. Leaving Bombay, it passes through Salset, crossing to the continent opposite Tana, goes over the chain of the Western Ghats, runs thence northeast as far as Burhapur, skirts the nearly independent territory of Bundelkhand, ascends to Allahabad, turns thence eastwardly, meeting the Ganges at Benares, then departs from the river a little, and, descending southeastward by Burdivan and the French town of Shandanagar, has its terminus at Calcutta. The passengers of the Mongolia went ashore at half past 4 p.m., at exactly 8 the train would start for Calcutta. Mr. Fogg, after bidding goodbye to his whist partners, left the steamer, gave his servant several errands to do, urged it upon him to be at the station promptly at 8, and, with his regular step, which beat to the second, like an astronomical clock, directed his steps to the passport office. As for the wonders of Bombay, its famous city hall, its splendid library, its forts and docks, its bazaars, mosques, synagogues, its Armenian churches, and the noble pagoda on Malabar Hill, with its two polygonal towers, he cared not a straw to see them. He would not deign to examine even the masterpieces of Elephanta, or the mysterious Hypogea, concealed southeast from the docks, or those fine remains of Buddhist architecture, the Canarian grottoes of the island of Salset. Having transacted his business at the passport office, Phileas Fogg repaired quietly to the railway station, where he ordered dinner. Among the dishes served up to him, the landlord especially recommended a certain giblet of native rabbit, on which he prided himself. Mr. Fogg accordingly tasted the dish, but, despite its spiced sauce, found it far from palatable. He rang for the landlord, and, on his appearance, said, fixing his clear eyes upon him. Is this rabbit, sir? Yes, my lord. The rogue boldly replied. Rabbit from the jungles. And this rabbit did not mew when he was killed. Mew, my lord. What? A rabbit mew. I swear to you. Be so good, landlord, as not to swear. But remember this. Cats were formerly considered, in India, as sacred animals. That was a good time. For the cats, my lord? Perhaps for the travellers as well. After which Mr. Fogg quietly continued his dinner. Fix had gone on shore shortly after Mr. Fogg, and his first destination was the headquarters of the Bombay police. He made himself known as a London detective, told his business at Bombay, and the position of affairs relative to the supposed robber, and nervously asked if a warrant had arrived from London. It had not reached the office, indeed, there had not yet been time for it to arrive. Fix was sorely disappointed, and tried to obtain an order of arrest from the director of the Bombay police. This the director refused, as the matter concerned the London office, which alone could legally deliver the warrant. Fix did not insist, and was fain to resign himself to await the arrival of the important document, 
but he was determined not to lose sight of the mysterious rogue as long as he stayed in Bombay. He did not doubt for a moment, any more than Passepartout, that Philia's fog would remain there, at least until it was time for the warrant to arrive. Passepartout, however, had no sooner heard his master's orders on leaving the Mongolia than he saw at once that they were to leave Bombay as they had done Suez and Paris, and that the journey would be extended at least as far as Calcutta, and perhaps beyond that place. He began to ask himself if this bet that Mr. Fogg talked about was not really in good earnest, and whether his fate was not in truth forcing him, despite his love of repose, around the world in eighty days. Having purchased the usual quota of shirts and shoes, he took a leisurely promenade about the streets, where crowds of people of many nationalities, Europeans, Persians with pointed caps, banyas with round turbans, sins with square bonnets, parses with black mitres, and long-robed Armenians, were collected. It happened to be the day of a Parsi festival. These descendants of the sect of Zoroaster, the most thrifty, civilized, intelligent, and austere of the East Indians, among whom are counted the richest native merchants of Bombay, were celebrating a sort of religious carnival, with processions and shows, in the midst of which Indian dancing girls, clothed in rose-colored gauze, looped up with gold and silver, danced airily, but with perfect modesty, to the sound of viols and the clanging of tambourines. It is needless to say that Passepartout watched these curious ceremonies with staring eyes and gaping mouth, and that his countenance was that of the greenest booby imaginable. Unhappily for his master, as well as himself, his curiosity drew him unconsciously farther off than he intended to go. At last, having seen the Parsi carnival wind away in the distance, he was turning his steps towards the station, when he happened to espy the splendid pagoda on Malabar Hill, and was seized with an irresistible desire to see its interior. He was quite ignorant that it is forbidden to Christians to enter certain Indian temples, and that even the faithful must not go in without first leaving their shoes outside the door. It may be said here that the wise policy of the British government severely punishes a disregard of the practices of the native religions. Passepartout, however, thinking no harm, went in like a simple tourist, and was soon lost in admiration of the splendid Brahmin ornamentation which everywhere met his eyes, when of a sudden he found himself sprawling on the sacred flagging. He looked up to behold three enraged priests, who forthwith fell upon him, tore off his shoes, and began to beat him with loud, savage exclamations. The agile Frenchman was soon upon his feet again, and lost no time in knocking down two of his long-gowned adversaries with his fists and a vigorous application of his toes. Then, rushing out of the pagoda as fast as his legs could carry him, he soon escaped the third priest by mingling with the crowd in the streets. At five minutes before eight, Passepartout, hatless, shoeless, and having in the squabble lost his package of shirts and shoes, rushed breathlessly into the station. Fix, who had followed Mr. Fogg to the station, and saw that he was really going to leave Bombay, was there, upon the platform. He had resolved to follow the supposed robber to Calcutta, and farther, if necessary. Passepartout did not observe the detective, who stood in an obscure corner, but Fix heard him relate his adventures in a few words to Mr. Fogg. I hope that this will not happen again," said Philia's Fogg coldly, as he got into the train. Poor Passepartout, quite crestfallen, followed his master without a word. Fix was on the point of entering another carriage, when an idea struck him which induced him to alter his plan. No, I'll stay, muttered he. An offence has been committed on Indian soil. I've got my man. Just then the locomotive gave a sharp screech, and the train passed out into the darkness of the night. End of chapter 10 This I think, is good place to leave our story for now. A bad dinner and a loss of pair of shoes and other garments, but otherwise the journey seems to progress quite well. There is of course the matter of Mr. Fix and his impending arrest warrant for Mr. Fogg. And what other things is Fix planning by staying behind in Bombay? You will find out that, and much more, in the next episode of Around the World in 80 Days.